Good morning. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. We are uh, finishing our walkthrough of the draft um, governance and task force bill. Uh, we got roughly midway through the bill yesterday afternoon. Our goal here for today will be to finish the walkthrough um, and then take a few minutes of committee discussion to, uh, to talk about some of the suggestions that have come in via email uh, that pertain to the whole bill. And then I'd like to take a, a break and allow Ledge Council time to draft uh, any of the changes that we uh, want to see, and then we will come back later this morning to do a final walkthrough and vote. Does that sound like a plan, committee? All right, excellent. Uh, so Becky Wasserman, thank you for being with us this morning. I think we left off on page 11 or 12, maybe? Yes, um, we left off on page 12, section three. Um, and I, I did uh, make changes based on yesterday's discussion, but for right now, as you said, I'm gonna just go back to draft 1.2 that was that's posted from yesterday. Um, so Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. Um, so I'm going to start at section three, which is the VPIC um, FY23 reports. And I'll just give everyone a moment to orient themselves. Um, okay. Uh, so this section uh, requires that the committee by January 15th of uh, 2022 develop <coughs> written policies for implementing both the asset allocation study um, and the asset and liability study that's required under their new uh, duties of the committee and has to make that policy publicly available on the committee's website. Um, one point I wanted to make here was that there's another re um, report, the annual reports from VPIC are, the language says that that should be on the treasurer's website. And um, when rereading this, I saw that this was um, to be posted on the committee's website. So I just wanted to point that out um, just to ask the committee if they wanted to make those consistent and if so, which, which website it should be posted on, which I think that the, the committee actually is part of the treasurer's website. Rep Gannon. Thank you. Um, that was going to be my point. I, I don't believe BPIC has a separate site from the treasurer's site at this point. However, I mean, that may change in the future as it becomes more independent, but currently that's not the case. Um, so for in case it does change for the purposes of statutory language, um, should I just uh, say that it should be publicly made publicly available um, without specifying the website. I think that makes sense. Agreed. Okay. Um, then in subsection B, uh, by July 1st of this year, the committee is, is tasked with hiring an independent consultant to review and report on the operations of the committee and the retirement division of the treasurer's office um, and make recommendations on best practices and necessary actions to transfer the committee to a standalone entity. Um, the report is also going to be looking at um, a review of budgetary authority frequency of trainings, um, transfer or hiring of personnel and compensation. Um, yesterday in the committee discussion, there was a request to clarify that that compensation should be for both the chair and uh, the employees of the committee. So that will be reflected in the next draft. Um, and then by uh, January 15th of next year, that uh, report would be sent to your committee and Senate gov government operations. Um, section four of the bill is amending the state employees retirement system board statutory language. Um, and the change here on page 13, line 11, is um, changing from a five-year period to a three-year period, the actuarial um, investigation. And this is made several times in each board's um, statutory section. Section five of the bill, um, this is more uh, an open question for committee discussion. Um, as I mentioned 
yesterday in each of the separate retirement systems board language, there's reference, it, reference to um, the treasurer uh, adopting standards of rules, standard of conduct for um, the trustees of that individual board, as well as members of the uh, of VPIC and employees of VPIC and the board. Um, in, the, in this draft, I had moved that uh, those conduct standards for the committee into the committee's duties and responsibilities. Um, but, you know, I just wanted to point out that this language is still here um, in each of the board's sections. Um, so uh, just, just raising how the, asking how the committee wants to deal with this policy decision of, of who should be adopting these standards um, for, for which entities. Representative Gannon. So, um, Becky, could you just clarify? Um, it seems like anything to do with VPIC should be in the VPIC uh, um, statute, not in the retirement board statute. So, is are we cleaning that up um, with this draft, or do we need to do it in the next draft? Um, so, right now in the um, in this draft, in the state employees retirement section, I did clean it up. I I, re I removed all the references to the treasurer doing this for um, the members of the committee and the employees of the committee. Um, I think for, uh, I did not make all of those changes in the teachers board section and the municipal board section because I just, you know, I wasn't sure what the policy decision of the committee, of, of your committee would be, um, but I can, I can make that cleanup changes change throughout statute statute if that's what the committee would like to do I just wanted to sort of reflect it in one of the sections so that you could see what it what I was referring to um, okay. I do think it's unusual to have um, this sort of cross reference in multiple different statutory sections I think it creates some confusion so it might be helpful to just have it all in the VPIC section of, of law with respect to the VPIC responsibilities. I, I think it would be helpful. And I think that's where people would go to look if they had questions about, you know, how VPIC is governed or governance issues, not the retirement board sections um, of statute. Madam Chair, do, do we want to, to propose that change or? I, yeah, I think that makes sense unless someone wants to jump in with a different idea. Not seeing anyone diving in. <clears throat> All right. Thank I'm you. good with that. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so I can make that change for all three systems. Um, so we can kind of go quickly through the next couple sections because that's just uh, repeating that change as well um, as the change from the five-year to the three-year um, actuarial investigation. So section six is changing that, uh, that time period for the actuary um, in the teacher's retirement system. And that is um, sort of bottom of page 14 to top of page 15. Section seven, I'll do that cleanup language in the teacher's board um, statutory section with respect to the standard of conduct. Um, section eight is uh, the five to three year change in the uh, municipal employee board. And then section nine is the uh, standard of conduct for the municipal retire retirement board um, language. Um, so that brings us to section 10, which is the uh, pension task force. Representative Gannon. Um, Madam Chair, perhaps before we go to the task force section of the bill, we should discuss um, the proposed changes that came from the chair of VPIC, Tom Galanka. Um, because those apply um, to this section of the bill, um, yep. not the task force. 
Yep. So the, um, I think those suggestions were sent to all of you via email. So um, go ahead and, and review that, Rep Gannon. Okay. Just pulling it up. Um, so his first proposed change um, dealt with the independent definition. Um, he suggested that instead of, of excluding people who were not independent because they may be a beneficiary of a pension, um, that we just require disclosure around that. Um, the reasoning being that with over 50,000 beneficiaries in the state of Vermont, um, that it's likely that a lot of people will be captured within this um, and exclude a lot of people from being able to serve on VPIC. Um, so rather than an, you know, a prohibition from serving on VPIC, this would just be a disclosure requirement. That's the first suggested change. How do committee members feel about that suggested change? All right, I'm seeing some thumbs up. Uh, in, in a small state like Vermont, it's not hard to get, <laughs> to, to get close to uh, beneficiaries of these two systems. Um, so I think it makes sense to allow for disclosure there. And uh, Peter, Anthony, do you have a question? Okay, back to you, Rep Gannon. Okay, so his second proposed change um, deals with um, term limits uh, around alternates that his recommendation is past time serve as an alternate um, be specifically excluded um, with respect to um, term limits. You know, his, his reasoning is alternate positions are excellent training ground. Actually, uh, Tom Galaka came up as a, a VMERS alternate. Um, so that was his suggestion. Um, having thought about this uh, quickly this morning, um, one thought is that, um, is that we retain that alternates have term limits. Um, at, similar to what members do, but that those term limits or their time served as an alternate does not um, count towards their service as a member. So for example, if somebody serves as an alternate um, for three terms and they then gets appointed as a member, they could serve a full three terms as a member of VPIC. I think we accomplish, you know, not having somebody just stay on VPIC forever and ever, um, but give alternates, you know, a training ground and then give them an opportunity to serve as a, a full, full member of VPIC. I think that accomplishes what Tom Galaka does, but maintains some control over how long people serve um, on VPIC. Uh, Rep LeClaire, on, are you responding to this point? Uh, yes, I am, Madam okay. Chair. Um, that, that concept actually makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I think it, it gets to a lot of the things that we're trying to get to, plus it lends itself to some continuity that I know there's been some concerns about over time. So I, I think that's a, a good idea. Okay. Um, other folks on this point, Rep. Anthony, are you on this point? Or I am, Madam Chair. Go ahead. As the reset guy, I think Tom's suggestion is really a, a, an ideal way to meld the continuity issue with the stay too long issue. Thanks. Rep Hooper. Uh, point of clarification maybe, are you saying John that since both the alternate and the primary of the subcommittees, the sub boards are elected or appointed at the same time. Uh, it would seem, if I understood what you just said, that somebody serving as an alternate for three terms would then be term limited out of serving any more time. And the uh, primary person would also be limited by the term. Is that what you're saying? No. Um, what I was proposing was that there would be term limits for alternates. Um, so they could only serve um, four terms, was it three terms, four terms, three terms. 
uh, four terms, three. three. Sorry, I'm getting confused there. Three terms as an alternate. However, that would not preclude them from serving as a member and their time served as an alternate would not count to their time served as a member. Does that, does that clarify what I said, Representative Hooper? Yes, thank you. Uh, Representative Colston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to uh, agree with the member from Barrytown, and I see this as a way of developing wisdom for the committee. So I think it's a great idea. All right, any other committee discussion on that? All right, back to you, Rep Gannon. Okay, so number three, I, I think number three is resolved. Um, let me, well, first let me explain what number three says. Um, it, it basically attaches the current listing of members um, and, you know, just notes that um, in, in Tom's situation, I was appointed 2012 as an alternate to VPIC for VMERS before be, became the voting member in 2015 and chair in 2016. Based on the language, I would be prohibited from serving as a member in 2024 and as chair in 2035, excluding alternate time, which is what we just proposed. Um, uh, that would increase that to 2028 and 2038 respectively. So I think we've addressed um, number three. Um, oops, yeah. Representative Hooper. Uh, thank you. Uh, Representative Gannon, we don't need to acknowledge or make a distinction that um, Tom is actually an employee of VPIC when we talk about the term limit or giving consideration to prior service. Is there a nexus there with employment law at all that we would effectively say you're out for, for no cause other than time? I don't think there's a, an employment issue with respect to that. Okay. I mean, you have, every, people have contracts for specific terms. No, I'm raising it. I'm not advocating yeah. one way or the other. I don't know that everybody knows that he's actually an employee. Should I, I go on to number four? Okay. Um, chair compensation. Um, he recommended not tying uh, that, that it should be reviewed after the expected consultant review is completed. Um, and he would recommend not tying it into a salary. I'm not going to go into what he recommends there, but the suggestion is that instead of tying it into the report of the independent consultant that we have VPIC report back to us um, next session on January 15th, 2022, with a plan to address um, the chair's compensation. Um, so that would give them some time to come up with a plan about how they want to address it. Um, Representative Anthony. I'm not sure helpful or not, but it seemed to me uh, disconnecting the uh, chair's compensation, even for an interim, disconnecting that from the treasurer was a good idea. Um, I, I was prepared to simply say, why don't we set a, 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 a level of pay for <clears throat> the chair until such time as a compensation study uh, is presented to us, and then we can change that uh, rather than continuing the tether. But uh, maybe this is just as well. Um, since I will likely have to go to appropriations to discuss this, um, uh, we would need some justification for increasing his compensation. Um, well, I, I think most of the committee believes that that compensation um, should be increased. Um, I would need to be able to justify um, that increase in appropriation. So I, mean, I just, I think this would allow us to have a report um, that would give us a path forward with getting um, this done. Um, but that's, but people could disagree with that. Rep Leclerc. Um, I have to say, I, I, I agree with that, but I also have to say that I, the, the comment made by the member, I think from Essex, Tanya, I think yesterday, 
um, about having that compensation tied to performance, I have to say I find very intriguing. Um, I'm not sure if this is the place to have that conversation. It may not be, but there is a part of that that I find um, I think would be beneficial. I think this is absolutely the place to have that conversation. I'm not sure this is the time to have that conversation, um, given that we'd like to uh, we'd like to have a little more context for uh, for how to do that, and I think waiting to do it when um, when VPIC comes back with a recommendation makes yep. sense to me. Maybe if they at least know they have the latitude to have that conversation, that would be helpful. Yeah, we could spe specify that in any language. So, yeah. All right. I forget, was that the last of the uh, recommendations that you wanted to review right now? Yes, I mean, number five in his email is just in, is just a statement that Treasurer Pierce and, and um, the chair of VPIC continue to work on a, a transition to independence and they're drafting a, a memorandum of understanding between VPIC and the treasurer's office to determine the best process for moving forward. So there's no action we need to take with respect to that. Great. Excellent. And Madam Chair, can I ask a question about the compensation issue? Um, just drafting. This is a little complicated because it is in statute, but you want a transition uh, salary, a tr transition sort of an interim period of a salary. So I can change statute to reflect that the committee um, shall determine the salary uh, you know, each year in their budget process. But then I think I need to, in the transition language, set a salary for fiscal year 22 um, so that the chair is actually paid um, for, you know, from, from the effective date of the act. Uh, so do you have a salary that you'd like me to put in for that interim time period until the board uh, makes that decision. Yeah, Representative Gannon has a thought on that. Yeah, I think we should stick with his current salary, which is one third okay. of the treasurer's salary, and not change that because, as we discussed yesterday, coming up a, with any sort of salary amount at this point without having done any research is just shooting in the dark. Um, so I think part of, part of the process is to have a study completed that would look at how other um, chairs of investment committees or retirement boards are compensated so that we would have some idea of how to set the salary in the future, whether we should even be setting the salary or whether VPIC, um, obviously with um, excluding the chair from that decision, should be setting the salary. Um, so I think those are the things that would come back to us in a report. Um, so I don't think we need to change the salary at this point. Representative LeClaire. Um, it, actually, John answered my question there, Madam Chair. I was looking to see if we knew exactly what his current salary was, but thank you. So, so since nothing is being changed, should I just leave statute as is for now and then um, not make any? Okay, sorry. I was, I was confused that there was a suggestion that there was going to be um, a, a new approach to doing it as of January when they come back. So I didn't know if you needed to set some sort of interim salary for that time period. Thank you. Uh, Representative Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This is kind of a when or if question. Uh, the chairs of other boards, similar labor board, places like that, uh, benefit packages, access to health care, those are things we might talk about when or if. I mean, if, are we- If VPIC decides to make a recommendation to the legislature to change that. For now, I, I think we're setting this, uh, we're leaving it alone at, at this point until VPIC comes to make a recommendation. Representative Anthony. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> but ought there to be language in there to 
recommend to the reconstituted VPIC that they do a compensation study or is that implicit? There is language in there right now. Oh, okay, does. sorry. Yeah. Then I missed it. Okay, thanks. All right, back to the draft. Okay. Um, so I believe we're on um, section 10 now, the task force language. Uh, subsection A creates the task force, which is the pe pension benefit design and funding task force to review and report on the benefits design and funding of retirement and retiree health benefit plans for the state employees retirement system and the state teachers retirement system. The membership of the task force is three members of the house, um, not all from the same political party who are appointed by the speaker, three members of the Senate, not all from the same party appointed by the committee on committees, uh, the director of the retirement division of the state treasurer's office, uh, Commissioner of Financial Regulation, the Commissioner of Human Resources. There are three members appointed by the president of the Vermont NEA, two members appointed by the VSEA, and one member of the uh, Troopers Association who's appointed by the president of the Troopers Association. Um, the members, um, the the House and Senate members shall not be direct or indirect beneficiaries of either system. Okay. Uh, so moving on to page 19, the members appointed, um, the uh, NEA member appointments, the VSEA and the Troopers Association appointments um, shall not be currently serving as a legislator or the spouse or partner of anyone serving as a legislator. Um, there's new language in subdivision C that says um, if a, des a designee is uh, appointed in someone's place and approved that um, that person shall be the only representative of the designator to participate in the task force proceeding. So you can only designate one, one person to take your place. In terms of the powers and duties of the committee, um, so the committee is looking at recommendations about benefit provisions and appropriate funding sources, along with other recommendations that are, it deems appropriate for consideration that are consistent with actuarial and governmental accounting standards, as well as demographic and workforce trends um, and the long-term sustainability of the benefit programs. Um, and then there are some specific uh, tasks that are listed here. Uh, so first is setting a pension stabilization target number for each system that one reduces the uh, actuarial accrued liability based on the actuarial value of assets by a sum that's the same amount as the increase in from fiscal year 21 to fiscal year 22 that was reported um, for both systems in the most recent, the June 30th, 2022 um, actuarial valuation and review. Um, and then the same for the um, actuarial determined employer contributions. Um, it has to reduce, they're looking to set a number that reduces that amount um, by the same amount that we that you saw in the increase from F year, from fiscal year 21 to 22 um, for both of those retirement systems. Subdivision B, um, the task force will be doing a five-year review of benefit expenditure levels, as well as employer and employee contribution levels and growth rates, um, and a three, five, and 10-year projection of these levels and rates. Um, based on benefit and funding benchmarks, uh, any proposed new benefit structures would be done with the objective of adequate benefits within the established cost containment benchmarks including an evaluation of a shared risk model for employee contributions and cost of living adjustments um, and, and an estimate of the cost of current and any proposed benefit structures on a budgetary pay-as-you-go and full actuarial accrual basis. The task force would also evaluate the intermediate and long-term economic impacts to the state and local um, 
I think that should be economies, I'll make that change, of proposed changes to benefits or contributions and their potential impact on retiree spending. Uh, they would also be evaluating any cross subsidization between the groups um, in the state employees retirement system and adjusting contribution amounts to eliminate any cross subsidization. Uh, the on the top of page 21, uh, the task force would evaluate alternative plan designs. This would include hybrid or defined contribution plan options or a com combination of a defined benefit plan and defined contribution plan. The committee, the task force will examine um, permanent and temp temporary revenue streams to fund the state employee system and the teacher system. Um, and there, uh, there was some language that was in the previous draft that also said, uh, including contributions from the state and employees to achieve benefit and funding benchmarks. Um, and I didn't, uh, that was just a question for the committee on whether that should still be, be in this um, particular uh, responsibility. Representative Gannon. Two things. I, I think the language in H is the language that we want. And I think we could eliminate that other language. Um, and another, and I, I just thought of this last night. And so this is new to everyone. Um, may, with respect to that, we've been focused on revenue streams, um, but there may be another way of addressing some of the concerns um, state employees teachers have about changing their benefits and, and you know I, I think um, there one option we may want a recommendation for is whether um, all or part of pensions are tax exempt um, because that's another way even if we were to um, reduce pension benefits if they became tax exempt um, at the end of the day it, there may not be any impact on the state employee or teacher. Um, so I just, that might be another tool in our toolbox that we want the task force to have. Do you have thoughts on where you would put that suggestion as a as a, an additional line or? Uh, uh, Madam Chair, I think it could probably um, go into H because that's sort of addressing um, the tax issues. Uh, but it could be a separate, a separate one. I would put it right under H if we were going to have it a separate subsection. Okay. Uh, Representative Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. John, I, I really, I like that idea <clears throat> on a lot of levels. But just to be real clear, though, we ought to probably talk specifically about income taxes uh, and, and not just use the general moniker. Um, obviously, it's implicit. It's Vermont because we don't have jurisdiction to change the federal. So, but I would be real clear that that's the category we're talking about. Thanks. Good comment. So committee, how do you feel about um, including that in the next draft to look at? Allowing the task force to look at the op alternative of making uh, pension income untaxable. All right, seeing thumbs up it's all around. Nobody's screaming. That's good. Thank you, Representative Gannon. Does that uh, go along with military pensions as well? <laughs> oh, just kidding. A different bill, different committee, Representative Higley. It's already in. <laughs> yeah, but it's germane. All right, back to the draft. Uh, sure, so subdivision I is looking at a plan for pre-funding OPEB um, with an evaluation of whether it's possible to use federal funds. Uh, subdivision J is a plan to lower OPEB healthcare costs, including uh, reviewing health benefit design innovations, state regulatory measures, and alternative methods of providing pooled healthcare benefits. Um, and then subdivision two makes it clear that the task force is not making any recommendations on adjusting the assumed rates of return. There, 
Uh, I don't know, um, Madam Chair, if there were, there was some suggestions yesterday about some additional language in this part of the bill. Do you want me to get through the, the remainder of the draft and then? Um... Let's pause for a moment and talk about the duties of the task force um, to the extent that members of the committee um, have happened upon suggestions or ideas here, I think it would be a good idea to pause and have a conversation about them. <clears throat> Anyone have a suggested change? Rep Fihovsky. Absolutely. Well, as I brought up yesterday, I would like to see included here um, evaluation of any changes to the plan and their impact on retention and recruitment, their impact, their cross subsidization to state benefit programs and their impact on school budgets, which I do believe is kind of captured in the local economy piece. And you have suggested wording to maybe expand on that uh, which, which letter is that? I did send some language. It was the, it was the NEA letter, but I did send some language to legislative council yesterday. I don't know, but I. Um, so I did, uh, I did put, um, just, I, I can read you what I had put together as potential language, if that is helpful, um, in the next draft just sort of open for committee discussion. Um, so I had changed subdivision D to say that the, the task force would be. Sorry, I, I accidentally muted you, my apologies. Um, the task force uh, subdivision D evaluating um, proposed changes to benefits or contributions with respect to um, First would be the intermediate long-term economic impacts to the state and local economies and their potential impact on retiree spending. Second would be impact on recruitment and retention of members of state, uh, sorry, of state employees and teachers as compared to the current benefit structure and contribution rates. And then uh, last would be pre-retirement and post-retirement welfare and financial security of uh, one, state employees and teachers who identify as female or as a member of the BIPOC uh, community, and two, state employees and teachers who, um, I think this language needs a little more clarification, but who has uh, perhaps a family income of a certain percentage less than the federal poverty level during their years of active employment and during their retirement. I, I think the open question would be what that percentage level would would be for house, household income. Right. Representative Piannon. Um Well, I, I think this is interesting. I, I just would like to understand um, how this would be accomplished um, by the task force, especially given the time period they have to make recommendations. Um, it would seem that it would be difficult for them to do this all this work because any changes they made to beneficiaries would have to go through an actuary to figure out what the costs were. Um, it could be, become very complex. Um, so I just want to understand how, how this would be done, what effort would need to, to be done, would experts need to be brought in to, to do this analysis. Um, I'm just confused about the level of effort this would take. It also occurs to me that it's possible there is a consultant uh, that or a stakeholder that we could direct the task force to hear from so that there is the expectation that this information will be presented to the task force, not that the task force is going to do a deep dive into, into that um, in their limited time. And so I wonder if there's some way we could designate um, that this information come from somewhere else and be put in front of the task force. Rep. Yehovsky. I am unmuting. My intention is that this information is used in any decision made and that it is not that we are looking at the whole picture and not simply making a decision now that actually will have longer term detrimental impacts to our retirees and 
potentially our taxpayers and our state. Um, how that information gets put in front of the task force, I'm, I'm not an actuary, I'm not a financial expert, I don't, I don't know, but I do think it is important information and it is incredibly short-sighted not to include it in our decision-making process. If that looks like getting it from another source and putting it in front of the task force and mandating that they use that in their decision-making, I'm, I'm certainly fine with that, but I do think it is incredibly important that it be included in the calculus. Rep. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, um, uh, my concern is, is that this task force, um, they've got a very heavy lift in front of them. They're, we're asking them to do a lot. And uh, I'm not sure if this information um, that we're talking about here, one is even available to be considered and used in deliberations. And I have to say there's a part of me that feels a little uncomfortable separating this group out. Um, we're, we're looking to make this equitable for everybody. Representative Anthony. Yeah, I, I'm just um, thinking about your comment, Madam Chair. I wonder um, one of the reasons I thought it was important to have the uh, Commissioner of uh, Human Resources there is precisely because that office would be nearest, if you will, to the issue of retention, uh, people uh, um, retiring early, perhaps leaving the state, uh, all those kinds of uh, influences that were, uh, are, are um, at least in the background, if not uh, immediately suggested by the task force work, work and I, I'm assuming that that person would be a resource, uh, maybe not for uh, um, qualifying for uh, federal programs under the 200% over the poverty limit uh, kinds of calculations, uh, but certainly the core uh, state interest in retention and, um, and the, the purpose of sustaining the retired workforce in Vermont. Uh, that I think the HR person can, can address, maybe not the poverty program aspect of this. Thanks. Rep. Pihovsky. Absolutely. Speaking to the sort of deeper dive into certain demographics, I, I think what we know is that women and people of color are systemically paid less. And so I'm certainly not suggesting we ignore anyone who doesn't belong to a group that is systemically paid less, but I think that we do, it does deserve a deeper dive into the, you know, does, are we looking at a group of people that is going to be even more impacted due to the systemic injustice built into our systems. We also know that our teacher system is 75% is women. So I'm not saying we don't look at everyone. I just think we need to pay particular attention to groups that are systemically paid less and systemically treated differently. We know that white women make, I think, 82 cents on the dollar, generally speaking, and, we, and people of color are even more impacted by those systemic injustices. So by no means am I saying we should not make it equitable for all, but one way that we do that, I think, is by digging deeper into groups that systemically have been treated differently. Rep. Cooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a tendency to agree. I think anytime we can look at a system with an eye to equity, um, we do our citizens and our country a disservice by not doing so. Thank you. <clears throat> Other committee discussion on this topic? Rep. LeClaire. Um, I guess I'm going to need to be given some examples of where the system that we have in place with our teachers and our state employees is, is systemically not equal. Um, uh, I guess I just need to have some specifics and some concrete examples where that's the problem. So let's flag this as, uh, as a, an area of concern. I, I'm not yet hearing consensus around the addition of an explicit um, change to the duties of the task force, but I'm wondering if there's a way that we could get this information in front of the task force um, by designating a stakeholder who might present uh, valuable information to the task force. Uh, Rep Merwicki. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I wonder, uh, since we are not the only state wrestling uh, with, with pension problems, um, I wonder if CSG or N NS NCSL uh, might have some resources that they can bring to bear on this that other states have already wrestled with. I know I've been reading up on states like Illinois, which I think is kind of the worst case scenario, but um, I, I don't doubt that these concerns may have come up in other places and maybe those, those, uh, those resources uh, from the, those national clearinghouses for information might be able to, to give some insights into this. Absolutely. Um, I did have contact with uh, the NCSL pensions uh, guru yesterday, and uh, we had we have aspirations to connect today on the phone. I can certainly uh, ask this question of them. Um, so it's a, it's a helpful suggestion. Um, Representative Colston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wonder if uh, this conversation can be addressed in the stakeholder input, where we have an opportunity to uh, hear and understand. Um, so I, I just wonder if that's a place for it. I do as well. Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, also in that section, I guess, uh, we all, I believe, got a email from um, um, the judiciary, Pat, Pat Gable, uh, wanting to add something in that section as well, section D. And uh, I don't know if now's the time to talk about that or, or have Pat in or whatever, but um, I know that that looks like they, I don't know if it would be uh, in reading her recommendation, um, I don't think it would be an added member, but it spe specifically spells out uh, somebody I believe in in that group. Yeah, yeah. Um, I saw that suggestion and thought it was helpful as well. Um, you know, there are other ways of getting important perspectives in front of the task force other than uh, creating another seat at the table, and one of them is is uh, <laughs> designating uh, who the task force should get stakeholder input from. So. Uh, we'll we'll certainly get to that um, in a moment. I um, let's see if we have uh, any sense of how we want to move forward with respect to the uh, the suggestions that Rep. Behovsky put on the table. Uh, Representative Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you very much, uh, Representative Behovsky. I agree. I agree with with what Rep. Hooper said about equity. I just would reflect. Uh, I, I think we should make sure that the stakeholder and maybe language in there that the uh, task force definitely invite in uh, members who we think possibly uh, ha have been unfairly uh, or systemically um, subject to uh, unequal access to wages, benefits, employment, et cetera they should be in as stakeholders. And I say that because as I think all of you know, uh, almost all the benefit structure is a reflection of the salary structure. And yet none of us, I think are uh, uh, poised to dig into the, uh, the way in which uh, the executive branch essentially uh, treats uh, its, uh, uh, how shall I say, position at the collective bargaining table. And yet that's the root, uh, if you will, of how the benefits picture play out. Uh, so I definitely uh, support the idea of stakeholder involvement from the judiciary, from the BIPOC community, but I, I'm not sure where you would go, where the task force would go uh, on the benefits side, uh, even if it discovered uh, that there were certain uh, segments of, of, of the beneficiary pool who, who suffered uh, some systemic or unusual um, uh, inequity. Uh, I don't know where that would go, um, frankly. Um, it would raise a host of other questions, I guess. So I, I think stakeholder uh, focus is, the, is really the best remedy we could, we have capability to address. Thank you. Rep Higley. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess just thinking about it a little bit, I, my concern, I guess, with whether it's the BIPOC community or uh, women's groups, whatever, who would that, who, who would represent those groups? I mean, there, there's, you can't just have it open-ended like that. Uh, I would think that you would have to have uh, a certain designated group or individual, but that's, I don't see, I don't see how you can leave it open-ended. Rip LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I agree with the member from Manuski as far as I think that the having that sort of representation and why, why can't the listed groups that are already there, um, they have members of that community that they can call on to be representatives already. I mean, there's nothing excluding anyone, but I do agree that the stakeholder portion of it is probably a good place for this conversation to happen. Rep. Kuhowski. Thank you. In terms of who I think some obvious people or obvious groups come to mind as the Women's Commission and the Office of Racial Equity, um, if we're looking to name specific people to bring to the table, um, I think, yeah, I, I think I'll leave it at that for the moment. Okay. Other thoughts on on this topic. Can right. I get back in real quick? Yes. I, I clarified my thoughts a little bit. Um, I think that sort of in looking at this and looking at a profession that is dominated by women who, again, we know systemically are underpaid um, compared to their male counterparts, I think it is just really important that we look at the impacts to that community with changes that we make. Um, and we know that we are, you know, coming through this pandemic, women have been inordinately impacted, women have had to leave the workforce. I think it's really just important that we look at how does this impact that, how would changes impact that community? I, I was having a harder time earlier sort of articulating why, why it was important that we sp specifically look at groups that are inordinately impacted. And we know that those same groups um, have, so it, so it isn't so much looking at specifically or only looking specifically within this, but sort of the larger picture, does this further move us in a, an inequitable direction if we make X change to a benefit to a larger group? So I just wanted to kind of suss out as I was kind of processing in my own head how to word that. So how does the committee feel about adding um, a, a section in the stakeholder input that uh, directs the task force to hear from the Commission on Women and the Director of Racial Equity. Representative McCarthy. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, I don't, I, I think that the task force should absolutely look at the equity issues that Representative Yehovsky brought up. I'm trying to, in my mind, figure out if the best way to do that is to specifically tell them to talk to certain people specifically give them issues that they should discuss or to trust that the makeup that we've put together that has you know three NEA representatives on the task force that they would be people who would bring those equity issues that affect the professionals in their the the group that they represent um so I'm I struggle a little bit without seeing language in front of me and we know we're so close to trying to get this bill on its way that um, I think, you know, if there was a specific proposal, I kind of feel like we're floundering all over the place trying to get our hands on a really big issue of equity kind of at the uh, the eleventh hour. Um, and uh, you know, I absolutely think that those issues are very important, but I want to make sure that we articulate them in a in a way that doesn't tie the task force in knots. Rep Pigley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, having a little bit of time to reflect on this, uh, I don't see uh, really the, the task force role in looking at an equity issue in the sense that uh, I understand the equity issue, but that's more on the pay end of things. I mean, their, their equity issue is uh, treating everyone fairly in regards to the 
uh, you know, the, the benefits, the, the, the pension benefits. So if I understand there may be a, a disparity in pay or other things for some of these groups, but uh, tell me, tell me how the task force looking at the pension equity thing is, is needs to be looking at, uh, you know, a pay issue. I think the linkage there is that your pension benefit is uh, is a percentage of your income. Well, well, again, but but that's 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 a uh, pay issue. It's not a pension issue. I mean, are you going to adjust the pension based on pay? I mean, um, no, I, but you know, I, I think I think it's worthwhile. Um, and back to what Rep. McCarthy said about um, not wanting to spin ourselves in circles for too long. Uh, it's worthwhile thinking about whether there is a way to uh, at least put these issues on the table in front of the task force so that as uh, the task force is working together to develop recommendations, they're not doing anything to exacerbate the situation, right? I mean, we, we know they're not going to fix the, uh, the, the salary scale aspects of it. But we, I think it's reasonable for us to, uh, to ask them to be very mindful of not making the problem worse, making the inequities worse. Uh, Representative LaFave. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to come on and say that I supported uh, Representative McCarthy's thinking of, you know, to me, in the very beginning, I thought that we were all coming from a background of give whoever, you know, give everyone a seat at the table, give them whatever they need to get the job done so that way it can be done right so we don't come back here in 10 years. Um, so I think us, you know, pres you know, being descriptive of who they need to talk to, I would rather them have the idea, you know, and trust that we are having the right people appointed and sent to this table um, to do the work. And, you know, I trust that they would understand some of the disparities that are occurring um, as sad as unfortunate as they are, I also agree that maybe this isn't, I understand the ties between pension and pay, um, but I think that's a bigger discussion that needs to occur. Um, but I do support that it's something to be brought up, but I don't wanna to dictate to them what they, who they should and shouldn't talk to. I want the resources available to them. Um, if we need something we can do on our end to make sure those people are available, um, but I don't wanna tell them what they, sh you know, who they should or shouldn't be talking to. Rep. Vyhovsky. Thank you. And I think you sort of summed up so well, Madam Chair, my sort of point in making sure we don't exacerbate already existing issues. In terms of this sort of being at the 11th hour, I mean, I saw the draft for the first time yesterday. It does, it's, it was on, like I responded when I could respond. And I think with all due respect, we have spent decades hoping that the people at the table will bring these things up or, or trusting that they will and they haven't. And so I actually think it is really important that we name it explicitly as something that has to be addressed and considered. Yeah. Rep. Colston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have the language to propose. Um, so on page 21, line 19, uh, after stakeholders, uh, the following language, including those impacted by issues of inequities. Committee discussion. Rep. Pihovsky. I, I think that that starts to get at the issue and I appreciate you in, in working on that. I do think it is important though that we explicitly name that it's part of the, like part of the process is ensuring that our, whatever choices we make don't exacerbate the problem as, as you, and, and maybe Madam Chair, seeing as you framed it so perfectly, you have some thoughts on how we might frame that in the language as well. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and, and of course it never, it never comes out when on demand in uh, in the middle of committee deliberations. <clears throat> um, I wonder if we might um, wonder if we might just flag this as something that we intend to come back to in terms of perfecting how we want to express that stakeholder input um, <clears throat> and uh, 
I will note for the committee that, you know, even though it is our intention to move this bill out today, there, there are other stops that the bill has to make before it gets to the floor. And if we have the ability to find some consensus around how we designate uh, this stakeholder input with respect to equity, we can certainly offer a committee amendment um, when the bill gets to the floor, uh, if we haven't been able to figure it out today. <clears throat> Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have to say, I like the member from Unusi's suggestion. It's very short, sweet, to the point, but broad enough that it takes into consideration anyone who should have some participation in the conversation. So how do we feel about uh, adding uh, that short phrase that uh, Representative Colston suggested and, um, and then sitting with it for a while to see if there's something else we feel like we need to uh, to do. All right, looks, looks like thumbs up all around. Excellent. Representative Anthony. I just, I, it, I think it wouldn't be too difficult uh, for Rebecca <clears throat> to wed the short phrase that uh, Rep, uh, Representative Colston put in uh, and meld that with the idea of making sure that any inequities that were uh, observed uh, not be made any more severe and just leave it go at that uh, and not be prescriptive about it. Thank you. Yep. So, so one, one thought I can propose is that um, in subdivision two, where it says the committee is not making recommendations on adjusting the assumed rates of return, I can maybe add some language that uh, also says that any recommendations that are made shall consider, um, you know, not, I'll phrase it differently, but not exacerbating any inequities. Um, and uh, I don't know if you want to address the retention question as well, but um, you know, recommendations would also look at uh, retention issues. Yeah, I've had a lot of conversations with folks about the value of a good pension benefit with respect to recruitment and retention. The, the conundrum that I keep coming up against in the context of this task force is that, um, the task force doesn't have, um, you know, doesn't have any way of swaying the other parts of a full compensation package, whether it be healthcare or salary or um, paid leave or whatever. Um, so yes, yeah, still, still trying to figure out how to, how to ask the task force to recognize how the pensions fit within the, the larger compensation and, and its impact on recruitment and retention. Rep Gana, did you have something you wanted to suggest? Um, actually, nothing to suggest. Um, just a, a, a question. I mean, both state employees and teachers are subject to collective bargaining agreements and I don't believe collective bargaining agreements treat people differently based on their gender or their color. Um, but maybe I am incorrect in that assumption. <laughs> Representative Bielski. Um, I just wanted to respond to that. I'm, I'm looking at a broader issue, not necessarily. So we know that teachers specifically are 75% and we know that professions that are largely women are often underpaid. So I'm looking at this larger picture of does a, a particular change mean that a lar that women as a whole will be continue to be in an inequitable space? So not necessarily within the collective bargaining space, but in the larger structure. Thank you for that clarification. All right, so let's sit with this, um, with the intention of adding uh, the short phrase that Representative Colston suggested. Um, Becky, if you have, if you want to put that language in front of us, and and we'll take a look at it on our next walkthrough um, after we've had a chance to sort of digest and process this. All right. 
Uh, we've got a couple more pages of the bill and then. Um... Sure. Um, so I think we're on stakeholder impact in subsection D on page 21. Um, so during the course of del deliberations, uh, the task force uh, will uh, solicit input, including through public hearings from affected stakeholders and consult with group D members of the state employee system and members of that system employed as state correctional officers. And I believe there was uh, an issue raised uh, about that the judiciary had some language as well to add in here. Yes, Representative Higley, I think, brought that up. But Representative Gannon, do you have it right in front of you? Yep, I have it. Um, their, their language would um, uh, change um, D subsection two, um, and it would say to consult with one uh, representatives designated by the Supreme, Supreme Court acting in its constitutional role as the administrator of the judicial branch. Questions, comments on that? Representative Hooper. Uh, on the whole section there, Madam Chair? Um, specifically on the judiciary language that Rep. Oh, Gannon talked judiciary about. Judiciary language, great. All right. Rep. Behoski? Um, I was glad to see this. As the committee knows, I have concerns um, with the larger structure of the task force and felt one of the pieces that was missing was judiciary's representation. So I'm certainly happy to see that that they are included. I wonder if a, if stakeholder input is the best place or if they should actually have a full seat on the task force. Um, but I definitely am glad to see that they have reached out. I am as well. Uh, Representative Cooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is on sub two there. When we talk about state correctional officers, are we talking about the broad swath of all of them or just the in-facility ones? The language doesn't specify. Um, I think it's, it's trying to capture all correctional officers. Um, it's, it's not specifying those that work in a facility. Okay. Because the probation and parole people are technically that. It's a pretty broad category. Representative Anthony. I was going to say, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, it, it happens that I th believe the uh, facility folks are actually part of a different group uh, or certainly have uh, an unusual or uh, differentiable uh, set of terms for their uh, benefit package. And that's kind of why I, I think Rep. Hooper's question is, is well put because they are treated differentially uh, because of the physicality and the early retirement and so on and so forth differences. So I, I, would, I would favor, frankly, uh, being more specific in terms of who you invite in precisely because this is not a homogeneous group. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I would just say that I think the language was attempting to capture everyone because it would be, uh, because, every, because uh, members are in that category are in different groups, it would be uh, harder to name everyone specifically. So this was, the, the intent was trying to, um, be very broad here so that um, anyone would would feel that they could be consulted on it. Um, but of course, the committee can have a policy decision to specifically name certain um, types of uh, employment categories. Representative Gannon. Well, I think Representative Anthony, um, answering my question is just having narrower language with respect to this um, to correctional officers. Um, so I think that that would be a good idea if that's what we're, I think that's what we're trying to do. Representative Hooper. Uh, thank you. Well, following up on that line of conversation, I initially thought this might be getting towards the people who at this time have the 20 year and out clause, which is not everybody that works for corrections or is a corrections officer. So 
that sort of is the clarity that I was looking for where we're, where this language was headed to some degree. Other committee discussion and suggestions, comments? All right, let's, uh, let's be specific about uh, uh, folks within the correction system and we'll take a look at the language um, after we've seen group D reference separated out from that and see if there's anything else we need to add. So I think I might need a little more guidance on what specific uh, groups or I guess it's not a, a pension group, but what specific specific members you would like um, listed. Anyone have a suggestion on how to specify? Representative Hooper. Well, again, I don't know how specific we can be without knowing what we're trying to do, but I mean, the, the current 20 year early out provision is directed towards people who work in facility. Um, but a corrections officer is also somebody that goes out and does home visits to make sure your battery's charged in your ankle bracelet. Uh, you know, it's pretty broad. I don't know where we're trying to go with this language. So consult on so, so is That's it just why. referencing anybody who is employed by the Department of Corrections? Would that be rather than saying correctional officers? Well, this is why I asked the other day about whether we were talking about Plan G here, which is sort of a specific subset, but apparently that's not the case. So I, I don't know where to draw the line without knowing what the picture is. Representative Anthony. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, let me suggest that we uh, use a general term like employees of corrections, but then specifically uh, say um, that the folks who are uh, officers in facilities, I think that's G. G is in, uh, am I right, Rep Hooper? Uh, it is G. G is a uh, proposal that, uh, that a new group be created that would uh, extend a different benefit structure to people with those physically demanding jobs in the Department of Corrections and um, other places. And other places. Yes. Yeah, I, I just think the overarching one, but then comma, especially uh, in here from uh, the Group D folks is, is useful. So they'll get the general and they'll get the specific uh, when they invite those people in to testify. Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I um, my, my concern about this is the more prescriptive we get about this, um, my concern is that this task force, I guess that's the terminology here, um, I, I want them to be able to have as broad and free ranging of a discussion as they need to have to address this, these issues going forward. And my concern is if we get too prescriptive, um, one, we could bog the conversation down, but two, would they interpret it that because it wasn't specified that therefore they shouldn't uh, uh, discuss it? Do you know what I mean? I, I, I don't wanna send a mixed message to these folks. I don't think anything should be off the table. So Becky, let's uh, let's take a look at a draft that specifies um, that this they should get stakeholder input from employees of the Department of Corrections, and we'll leave it at that. And the task force can um, can and will hear some new ideas presented from that perspective and can decide what to do with it. Okay, sounds great. Um, so I will move on to assistance in subsection E. Uh, 
so starting at the top of page 22, um, the task force has the administrative, technical, and legal assistance from the Office of the State Treasurer, uh, fiscal assistance from the Joint Fiscal Office, and committee support services from the Office of Legislative Operations. Subdivision 2 uh, allows the task force to contract uh, for an independent benefits expert and legal expert as necessary. And there's an amount of uh, $200,000 in general funds that's appropriated for that purpose, those purposes. Um, subsection F is a report. Uh, so this report is due September 1st. Uh, that report would go to the governor and the House and Senate Committees on Government Operations and would have some recommendations um, findings and recommendations for legislative action. And the, the task force would also be sending a copy of that report to the boards of each of the retirement systems for their uh, consideration. In terms of meetings in subsection G, uh, the members, uh, the, the House and Senate members of the committee, so those six members would uh, select from amongst themselves a House and Senate co-chair for the committee. Um, and those co-chairs would call the first meeting of the committee by June 15th of this year. A majority of the membership of the committee would constitute a quorum, and then the task force would cease to exist by June 30th of next year. In terms of compensation and reimbursement, um, attendance at the meetings for legislators, uh, those legislators would uh, get per diem compensation and reimbursement. Um, so right now this draft says for not more than six meetings and I believe yesterday that was changed to 12 meetings. And that money for would come from the amount appropriated to the legislature. For other members of the committee who are not state uh, employees, they would also get compensation and reimbursement for, for uh, 12 meetings and that will come from money appropriated to the state treasurer. And then uh, finally, section 11, the effective date, the act would be effect effective on passage. Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I guess uh, we did talk about 12, but then I thought at the end we bumped it to 15, just to, you know, have that little extra amount if they needed it. I, you know, that's that was what I thought, but up for discussion, I guess. So let's draw a poll that. How, how do people feel about giving the flexibility of 15 so that if there's something that requires a quick turnaround, they could meet twice in a week? Okay, I'm seeing thumbs ups all around. I, Matt, Thank you. Madam Chair, I, I did, but change. then I made a comment about uh, committee meetings. I don't know whether we even should muddy the waters of subcommittees, not the task force, but okay. But I, yeah, I threw out the the 15, but not counting uh, subcommittee meetings. Thanks. Rep Fihovsky. Um, I meant to actually take my hand down. I was, it was 15 that I was getting at. I mean, I wanna have some larger comment, but we're not there yet. <laughs> okay, uh, Rep Colston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just have a minor edit to offer on page one, uh, line 10. Uh, and in order to be consistent, I think, design should be included, pension benefits design and funding task force. Mm -hmm. Thanks, I did I did catch that and I made that oh, okay. change in the, the next draft, thank you. Yep. We can always count on the member from Winooski for his um, very fine uh, proofreading skills. <laughs> there was a duplicate word in there though that uh, Ledge Council thought that you hadn't yet suggested, so. I was wondering if uh, maybe eye fatigue was setting in after too many long hours on Zoom. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, we are set with the uh, uh, 15, flexibility of 15. Um, does anybody else wanna make comment on any of that last section before we come back up to the top for, for any final? conversation before we take a break for redrafting. All right, back to the top, page one. Um, I just wanna make sure that we have reviewed um, any other suggested changes that 
may have come in uh, to the committee. Representative Hooper. I hesitate to go back, but the last thing I had suggested that if the committee decides they need more time, joint fiscal consider be considered to give them a a window to go a little longer. Is that not favorably considered? I notice it's not in here. Let's open that up for committee discussion. I, um, I mean, I have thoughts about it, but I don't wanna try to sway the, the open committee discussion. Rep McCarthy. I feel very strongly that we should put a hard date and try to get the committee to get us a report and you know, we've never put anybody in chains for being a week or two late on these kinds of reports, uh, but I think we've all acknowledged the urgency. Um, you know, we are doing this and setting up this task force to be responsive and give more time, but we need this, these recommendations and we need them so that there is time for people to respond, for legislators to get up to speed and for us to take action next year. So I feel very strongly that we should set a hard date and have the commission, the task force work to that date. Rep Vyhovsky. I suspect I will be in the minority here, but given the met, as we pointed out repeatedly, this is a pretty broad scope that brings in lots of voices of, across a summer right after COVID when people may be in and out. Um, and I feel that some flexibility around the date is actually really important. And given that it is a, this report is to advise a legislature that won't be that likely won't be acting on it until January, I think we do have the room to offer the possibility of some extension. Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Matthew. I agree with the member from St. Albans. I think that a a hard date that gives somebody something to work towards. And I'll add that the number that we're trying to address here continues to get larger by the month. I think what I would want to add to this conversation, and this is really um, fairly internal to the workings of this committee, uh, as much as we might have wanted to think that, uh, that we're going to adjourn in May and come back in January, uh, we have this little task of um, getting input and feedback from boards of civil authority around the state with respect to redistricting plans. And so we have a lot on our plate for this fall. And uh, to, so to the extent that we can uh, hope to have this report in September, uh, I think it will be to, <laughs> to the benefit of um, staging that workload that we have within committee. Um, and Rep McCarthy makes a very good point that um, we don't throw the report in the trash just because you missed the deadline by a week or two. Um, Representative Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm not addressing the issue of the report being generated. I'm addressing the issue of whether or not the committee has adequate time when they get backed up against the real decision-making process to get everybody in, everybody talking and reach agreement. At this point, we have it set at June 30th six months from normal convening, and even that would be 60 days before the scenario that you lay out. I, I would hate to see this be rushed just because we have placed an ironclad deadline on it. Thank you. Any other committee discussion on the topic of deadline flexibility? Um, could I just add, oh, sorry. Yes, go ahead, Becky. I, I just wanted to add from, um, I guess, a, a drafting perspective that um, I think it's less typical to have a uh, another authority granting uh, an extension of time during um, the interim. I think it would either, it might make more sense just to push the date back. And part of the reason I'm saying that is also that for appropriations purposes, um, because you are allowing them to meet for a certain number of meetings, um, I think that does go into the, the budget question of what is being appropriated for the uh, expenses and, and reimbursements for the members of the task force. So that would be just another consideration of um, if you wanna just extend it to 
you know, I'm just randomly picking, you know, November 1st, and then have the meetings court, the number of meetings correspond to, to what that would equal out to. Yeah, it opens up a, a whole new set of considerations. Representative Merwicki. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just going to reiterate what I shared the other day about um, my understanding of and experience is that uh, hard, fast deadlines are inspiring and, and sometimes liberating. And uh, I think this is uh, a time when keeping people's feet to the fire and not letting them drag is, is, is essential. Okay, so I'm, I believe I'm hearing not unanimity, but um, a majority consensus to leave the deadline where it is um, without specifying uh, any ability to extend that deadline. Is that what you're hearing? Okay. All right, super. Um, Let's, anything else um, on the end of the bill, the effective date, the, the due date, all of that, or can we come back to the beginning and make sure that we have considered uh, any other drafting changes that we would like to ask Ledge Council to make before we take a break? Okay. Um, Representative Gannon, anything else you think we need to talk about? Um, a, a very minor issue, but um, um, is the name of VPIC. Um, given that we're standing up an independent entity, um, should its name slightly change so that it's not just a committee? Um, I'm not sure of too many independent committees. Um, for example, like the Women's Commission, it's a commission. Um, the equity panel. I, I mean, so that's just minor, minor point, but I, I don't think we stand up too many independent committees. So from a drafting perspective, Becky, does it make sense to rename this as the commission? Um, yes, I would, I would agree that um, just in looking at other examples of independent entities, they're typically boards or commissions. Um, so that would make sense to be consistent with um, other types of independent entities that are created in statute. Um, committee discussion on the question of committee versus commission. Representative Anthony. I definitely think you ought not to be committee. If you wanna differentiate the old from the new, then this should become a board. And then the acronym changes. Thank you. <laughs> it does change. Well, we have system boards. And so I wonder if we might stick with commission, um, but happy to have that committee discussion. Rob LeClaire. I just want to know how you're going to pronounce the acronym. PIB is a very strange acronym, VPIB. <laughs> it's actually kind of a funny one, but. Um, but if we stick with commission, we can still call it VPIC, which rolls off the tongue. Any other committee discussion on that? I, I will. Uh, I will raise that if I if I do that, since um, there's so many cross references in Title Three, it would be. Um, it's going to change the length of the bill significantly. <laughs> yes, um, and I could perhaps add in language that Ledge Council can, can make sure that everything is um, sort of tidied up in statute over the summer if, if that's, uh, that could be one option. I, I can kind of do my best um, to, to find all those references right now, but it does change. I think they're probably mentioned in quite a number of other statutory sections. Let's see if we can find that um, that shortcut method of aligning other statutes uh, with this name change. And that seems a little bit better than trying to add another 70 pages to this bill. 
that John Gannon has to report on the floor and then <laughs> and then could be interrogated on simply because we made a, a change of committee to commission. Rep Kihovsky, you had your hand up, I think, uh, on the broader question of anything else to put on the table. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to come back to my concerns around the makeup of the task force. And I know yesterday it was brought up that, you know, people had received a lot of emails, which I was honestly confused by because I hadn't yet checked my email for the day. I have I spent was up late into the evening on the phone with constituents and was up early this morning on the phone who continue to share their concerns with the balance of the committee. And I know that multiple um, ideas and thoughts have come forward about ways to potentially address some of those concerns. Um, and I think it's worth looking at the various possibilities. I know one way of addressing it has come up is, is having one of the House and one of the Senate members appointed by the Workers Caucus. I know another thought that has that has been put on my, you know, in my mind is ensuring that there's tripartisan representation rather than simply not from the same party. Um, I would as I said yesterday, suggest we sort of expand the task force to include more representatives from people who are pension beneficiaries. Um, but I will say that I'm continuing to hear significant concern in this area. Committee discussion, uh, Rep McCarthy. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I too was on the phone late into the evening with constituents uh, who were primarily concerned about the makeup of the task force in previous iterations. I think this uh, proposal that we have in front of us that has an additional NEA member and the additional VTA member um, address a significant amount of those concerns for folks, but there continue to be um, what I would consider sort of, you know, one click politics style uh, email links um, that are on Facebook pages that are generating a significant amount of email based on the previous iterations of the proposal. So I've found that in the conversations I've actually had with constituents that the balance of, you know, the additional uh, employee or plan member representatives there and the proposal we actually have in front of us has alleviated a lot of those concerns and that most of the feedback that I'm getting is coming from previous versions of the proposal. So that's been my experience. Representative Colston. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I learned from um, a certain um, union leader that the concern of balance was one of tripartisanship. And I, I directed him to the section in the bill that speaks to that uh, as members will be chosen and, and not to be a, of the same party. And, and that, in my understanding, satisfies the issue of balance. Thank you. Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I too have spoken to several people over the last several days about this. And obviously it depends on which version that we're referring to. But when I've had the ability to speak with the folks, um, usually over the phone, by the way, um, when we can differentiate the difference between VPIC and I guess the task force, um, more often than not, there is a higher comfort level that they are comfortable with VPIC as far as it's only on the investment side that they're looking at things. When you're talking about the benefits side, or let me rephrase this, going forward, talking to some of the plan changes, that's when the conversation changes to looking to make sure that there's a bit more balance or representation there. So my experience has been that when we talk about VPIC in particular, there's a much higher comfort level with those that have the skill sets. Yep. Rep. Vyhovsky? Um I would agree with you, Representative LeClaire, and I am I'm definitely talking about my constituents' concerns with that task force balance. Um, the other thing I would, just in response to Representative Colston, I would agree with you, I have heard that same concern around tripartisanship. And I do think it's important to sort of explicitly name that, saying that it's three members not from the same party could mean it's two party representation. So if tripartisanship is, is the request, I think we need to explicitly name that. Committee discussion on that point. Representative Hooper. 
I certainly have no objection to including as many and as diverse as possible. So I would support that as a support period. It gives everybody a little bit of buy-in. And I think in this process, that is one of the most important things we can do. Representative Merwicki. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to raise a concern about fair representation here, if we're going to look at tripartisanship. Uh, let's look at the numbers that Vermonters have elected their parties. Um, both in the House and Senate, the, the, the majorities are pretty clear. And uh, I think if we're going to give equal standing to um, a party that has 92 caucus members to one that has what seven or eight. Uh, I'm not sure how that creates a level playing field here. Uh, so I'm going to hold up that concern. I think we're being very generous here in suggesting that we have members of different parties. But when we look at the numbers that Vermonters elected us, that it comes across very differently from my perspective. Uh, Representative Lafayette. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was saying I agreed with the comment a uh, couple before that I agree there should be tripartisan representation, but going off of uh, Representative Mariki's comment, um, I do feel that in different parts of Vermont, there might be different population or different parties elected higher. Um, but then once you get again into other parts where we still have participants of these plan, you know, plans, there is higher, uh, you know, some of the numbers might not be as reflective as other portions. So I would agree to try to urge to have the tripartisan values at the table. Representative Gannon. Um, for, first and overall comment about the makeup of the task force. I think we've worked very hard in listening to everyone who's had feedback with respect to the task force. And I think we've made substantial changes um, to in increase the balance of representation on that task force. Um, so we've tried to listen to people. And in conversations um, I've had with union representatives, they appreciate the work that we have done um, to change the balance. Um, they may not be totally happy with what we did, but I think they know that we are trying to make an effort to ensure that there is a balance on the task force. With respect to the legislative representatives, um, I, I think as many people have stated, we need skill sets on the task force that it can address this pension issue. I would hate to tie the speaker's hands to have to nominate somebody from, the, from one of the six members of the progressive party um, with respect to whether they have that expertise or not. I think we need to put the best legislators who have the, the, the correct experience on this task force, regardless of which party they are. Um, this is a heavy lift. Um, and I really don't think it is a partisan issue. Um, I think we all have been trying to work together on this. And I think we need to give the speaker the option of choosing who are the best people in the legislature and the committee on committees, the, the, you know, the best people in the Senate to work on this issue. And I think that's the most important issue here. Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I approve of the current wording in the, in the bill. Other committee discussion on this? Um, so I think I'm just gonna ask a straw poll question to gauge whether we need to continue to work on this. Um, how many folks are feeling comfortable with the wording that is in the current bill? Okay, that is a majority. Okay, um, anything else we need to review on over just overall um, before we send Becky off to do some final edits.
All right, Rip Higley, your hand is up. I assume that's just from before. Yeah, um, sorry. No worries. Didn't just wanted to make sure you you knew I was watching you. <laughs> um, so uh, the plan from here is to uh, is to take a break enough to allow time for Ledge Council to do their work on the bill and um, and come back to us with a final draft that we can then walk through. Um, so this is uh, this is my way of saying last call. If there's something that you thought could use some improvement, um, would love to have it suggested now. I'm gonna take a long pause and let folks scan through the bill one last time. Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I might have missed it, but um, yesterday I don't believe that I heard the actual wording around, I think it was on page 12, number two on, um, now I can't even think about, let me hang on, let me see if I can find it. Uh, Oh yeah, uh, the written copy piece. Did we ever come up with some actual uh, wording in, in regards to uh, that? Uh, that will That's be in the next, in, next Yeah, in the draft 1.3. So do you want okay. to point us to that? Um, sure, let me just find that really quickly for you. We had a, a draft 1.3 under today's committee date that, um, Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't even bring that one up. So no, no, no. Uh, I, yeah. Um, in draft 1.3, it now says written or electronic copy. Yeah, I found it. It's on uh, page 11. Um, so it says the committee shall send to each participant or beneficiary of each plan a written or electronic copy of the report uh, described in subdivision one of this section in the format authorized by the participant or beneficiary. The report shall be consolidated with any other reports required to be sent by the committee to the participants or benefic beneficiaries of each plan. Great, thanks, Becky. That sounds perfect. Um, and I, in Great. terms of the next draft, I'm going to keep it as 1.3, but just change the timestamp since this was sort of a, a work in progress. Um, just just to let you know, there won't be a, a 1.4. Yet. Yet. <laughs> the day's not over yet. Don't yes. jinx us. <laughs> okay. Um, anything else that folks would like to review or um, or check on before we take a break? Okay. So you need 30 minutes or so to draft and then um, hot help me understand the time frame then for editing and how best to uh, allow time for that. So I can send it to editing as soon as uh, I have a draft ready. Um, I, I gave them a, a heads up that it will be coming their way. So I don't know how long it will take, but it might be best for, for me to just go come back to the committee with what I, what I have the unedited version and then um, just wait for them to get it back to me and it'll probably come sort of while I'm walking through. Um, and if there's any sort of significant changes, I can I can let the committee know that. Okay, that's great. I'm, I'm, I'm we'll... hoping we're not making too many changes that it won't be uh, significant. Yeah, so we will have uh, the ability to, to look at uh, an edited draft before we, um, before we vote on it. That sounds great. Uh, so committee, it is 10.50 right now. Um, how about 11.20 to give 30 minutes break to, uh, to finish the redraft and, um, and get that sent off to editing? 11.20 sound good? Okay. Committee, have a nice 30 minutes. I hope you get some fresh air and sunshine 
and I will see you back here at